you know, fantastic talent is everywhere. And I don't, I don't think that can be denied. Uh, and, there, you know, there are massive economic efficiencies, gains to be made if you know how to work with and manage that international talent. Welcome to the Going Global podcast, brought to you by Globalization Partners. Hire anyone, anywhere, quickly and easily. Use our AI-driven, automated, fully compliant global employer of record platform, powered by our in-house worldwide HR experts with 97% customer satisfaction ratings. Globalization partners succeed faster. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Going Global, the podcast where leaders of high growth companies tell us their own stories of going global and building global remote teams. I'm your host, Diego Mendiburu, and remember that you can find all episodes of this show on Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. On today's show, we're going to interview Daniel Callahan. Daniel founded Tolmix, previously known as MBA and Company, one of Europe's earliest freelance marketplaces providing on-demand top-tier business talent for projects across 130 countries. And now, he's the founder and CEO of Barrymore, a digital background screening company that adds simplicity and confidence to companies' hiring process by helping them check the professional credentials and work history of prospective employees. Hello, Daniel, and welcome. Hi, Diego. Thanks very much. No, it's a pleasure to have you here. And, and I have a lot of questions regarding what you're doing now, but also how technology has transformed HR daily duties, but also, of course, recruiting. So I guess that's my first question. You know, if you could explain to the young audience here in this podcast, how was recruiting 30 years ago and how much has it changed? How was it done before the internet? Because, you know, I remember the first job I applied to ever in my life I literally found it on a newspaper. So things have changed a lot, right? Yeah, they definitely have. I don't quite know how it was done 30 years ago. I was, I'm not that old uh, <laughs> as of yet, but uh, I can certainly you know, even think back to how it's changed over the last 20 years whilst I've been in the workforce and then since trying to get a job come out of university. But uh, the scope and scale of change created by the internet and the ability for further change through technology is pretty pretty enormous uh, and I think it's, it's only going to continue or clearly going to impact not only recruitment but also how we how we work going forward. What I mean by making this question is that I guess that a lot of things that we take for granted in the process of screening a candidate didn't exist many years ago. I mean, what was the way of knowing if the candidate was saying the truth? What was the way of getting, you know, their uh, referrals? I guess it was, I don't know, how much information employers had many years ago in order to make such important uh, decisions of hiring or not someone. Yeah, I think the the core core bones of recruitment still remain remain the same. It's only the essence of it, right? So you, you'd have a candidate who would probably you know, back then have walked in to a recruitment agency and hand delivered or posted a copy of their CV to the agency. You, know, you certainly wouldn't be able to back then check things like the, the global sanctions lists or any international watch lists. The, you know, you'd still probably take reference calls uh, or people would turn up with their own pre-written references uh, would be quite common. You know, It's only really in the modern days where going forward further back to the whole industry around background screening to really check people's full credentials or academics, their full employment history has become such a large uh, and increasingly booming industry. But it is certainly, it's certainly true. We, it's great for the, the candidate that you have all this technological enablement now these days, but it's also pretty invasive, right? So you could nowadays, again, you know, Verimark offers things like social media checks and all kinds of adverse media checks. So you can you know, see if anyone's turned up anywhere in the world doing things they shouldn't have done or saying things they shouldn't have said on their post, social media posts that, that can ultimately very much affect their chances of being uh, given the job or not. So it's definitely, you know, technology has created a whole series of minefields and benefits for both. If you could explain or draw a timeline of how technology has disrupted recruitment and HR, where would you begin? And, and, and can you take us, you know, by the hand through the evolution of recruiting by using technology? What would be like the first change introduced by technology, by the internet probably, maybe just posting jobs online? And where are we now? Yeah, so I think probably could go back to the advances in communication. That will be of the greatest accelerant to the recruitment process. Uh, when you think manually how long it would have taken back and forth to to otherwise send copies of CVs in the post, 
So instantly starting to have things like even the fax machine, you know, would have been a massive innovation at that stage to speed up the process. The transition from the classified ads of job posting to the internet, and therefore then the first job boards uh, again would have been an evolutionary spark to the whole thing that massively brought the world much closer together. I mean that that must be the overall largest catalyst for for advancement in recruitment for sure. You know, but if you if you look now, you know that's sort of early nineties, early two thousands, and then you know, in sort of two thousand and nine. You had the advent of or the real dynamism around marketplaces and labor employment marketplaces uh, and gig economy marketplaces that again started to to create fundamental shifts in how people were working. Uh, although saying that actually Upwork, or as it was up, once called Elance and Odesk, started in, in sort of two thousand and one as well. So you know they, that model has been around for a while, but only started to bring a uh, real scale and awareness from an independent worker perspective. You know, with with the rise of the on-demand economy and Uber and and, and gig, gig workers that way uh, from a technology perspective, and then today, I mean, that's only got even faster. So the you know the on on-demand aspect is is pervasive in every aspect of, of our life, let alone just work. You know, the whole screening and vetting process has become artificial. You know, not only from an analytics perspective, where you know you no longer need to be interviewed by a person, but we'll we'll take like, you know, patient analytics. And tonal analytics of what you're saying to tell if you're if you're lying or or you know what type of person you are to speaking to a chatbot to collect all your information to to now being pushed through a whole series of automated workflows to to having you know almost the need to speak to no one to find your jobs in certain industry. So you know, there's been you know, clearly a massive whole change throughout the process, and uh, I think still there's a, lo- a long way to go really, but. More around the way that technology will will shape the world of work than shaping the world of recruitment. I think recruitment itself will just become increasingly data driven, increasingly AI led, but you know, happening at a much much faster and higher quality experience fashion than than probably what was happening you know, before technology got involved. That's super interesting. I guess like the last what would you say, four years with the advancement of AI and how companies like Amazon and Google and other companies have, you know, opened their tools for doing experiments with AI that really pushed, you know, the use of that technology towards all kinds of applications, including recruiting and HR, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't need a PhD in computer science or artificial intelligence now to start building AI tools or conversational chatbots or or start drawing analysis out of, you know, very large data sets. So, uh, that's been fantastic for the whole ecosystem, and and you're seeing, you know, obviously is why we're seeing so many businesses now being able to come up to that space because the the cost of launching the service is, you know, is the lowest it's ever been. So you built the first global on-demand talent marketplace, and you know, I was wondering when did the concept of global talent first appeared, or at least when you first heard about it. And which countries were the first like top suppliers of global talent? Yeah, well, I think uh, I think you're doing me a, a very favorable description there. So I don't know if we were the, <laughs> the first first market, but we definitely weren't the first sort of freelance marketplace as a fully operating model. What the my first business was certainly uh, the the early mover in bringing high end disruptive style of operating model to the professional services and, and high end consultancy market. Mm-hmm. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned before, you had you know, freelance marketplaces like Elance or Odesk uh, had been around since 2001, in 1999 and 2001, respectively. Uh, and by the time we'd started a business at MBA, called MBA and Company back in 2009, they'd already raised some 160 million from all the you know all the big names in Silicon Valley. But you know what we what we saw then at the time was actually you know, the ability to or increasing demand, you've got to realize this was straight after the, the global financial crisis. So there was lots of great people who were who are now more available than they were the year before. Was that you know companies were were looking for better you know better quality of flexible resource. It wasn't just about getting your logo designed for forty dollars by mm-hmm. by you know, a talented person in an emerging market, but actually companies wanted all kinds of business solved and the, the ability to automate matches and, and get get exactly the right person on exactly the right task was you know, it 
then becoming increasingly easy and now is even easier through technology. Uh, and that's really what we build it on. Um, and, that, and that's what MBA and company was about. So we saw uh, the difference, I suppose, from our platform. If you look at sort of traditional or the platform back then, the, the traditional freelance marketplaces have lots of sort of emerging market Indian and Vietnamese and type talent where you'd have lots of American buyers buying hourly solutions or fixed price projects that might range from about $159 to, to $4,000 was sort of the average project value at, a, at, a, at an e-lance back then. But as I say, buying you know, American clients, buying Indian talent. What well, we transitioned them because we, you know, our, our consultants were more like 800 pounds a, a day or 4,000 pounds a day was some of the highest that we're getting bought in the first years. Um, we saw a lot more domestic people. So it was, it was English companies buying or hiring rather English consultants or American consultants hiring, or American companies hiring American consultants. So it was a much closer project relationship than, than you saw on the, the global talent, on, on the, 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 the lower commodity, more skills, the lower priced uh, freelance marketplaces. But, you know, we, we went global from day one. I mean, we got featured in... Um, you know, the Economist and, and Business Week, and you know, there was a very nice article talked about you know, from business school to consulting empire uh, in, in in Bloomberg on our second month, wow. which you know just uh, transformed the the volume of candidates and profiles and awareness of what we were trying to do, and you know, so very quickly had ten thousand ex you know ex Harvard ex McKinsey types all uh, all registering to to get freelance projects. Uh, and they range from, you know, super serious partner level professionals, but also recent graduates who were recent business school graduates, because that was the min- minimum qualifying criteria at the time, that who um, were using it as a means to bootstrap their own entrepreneurial journeys. Uh, we, we were very proud that you know, we got to distribute millions and millions of dollars of work to, to people who were, you know, in, in turn then going using that as a, as a side gig to go on and build even bigger and better businesses. You, you just said something that is exactly one of the questions that I had written and prepared that we usually talk here in Going Global uh, with uh, business people that at one point took the decision of expanding their business to another market. But it seems to me that, yeah, you've had a global reach from day one in all your ventures, right? I mean, how did that happen? Was it something you planned? Was it something natural? How do you, do you manage to do that? Well, I think, um, yeah, fantastic talent is everywhere. And I don't, I don't think that can be denied. And there's, you know, there are massive economic efficiencies and gains to be made if you know how to work with and manage that international talent. I mean, the, the price discrepancies between a fantastic developer or, or, or business modeler in San Francisco versus Silicon Valley versus it is in Vietnam or, or, or Nigeria these days is enormous. From a, making use of it ourselves, we've always just recognized that you know, you don't need to be in the sort of the, the epicenter of the you know, talent ecosystem to, to be super high skilled. And then from a customer perspective, again, you know, we've just always known that the if you can start working out how, or we, we've always believed that if we can start working out how to do it on a larger scale, then, you know, ultimately those processes, and you know, we'll encounter the bigger challenges first and we might as well try and solve those ones straight from the get-go. Mm-hmm. And then to operationally, you'll be stronger going forward. And it's, again, with technology, to be able to connect a person in in a thousand miles away or ten miles away just doesn't become so much of an issue. As a, as business founders and entrepreneurs, what we've always tried to focus on is is creating a proposition that resonates globally. Mm-hmm. What a lot of our sales efforts still might be done on a more local level, but again, just through the the increased presence that we build in the market, we see you know global demand coming to us, and therefore. You know, need to work out how to solve that as well. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you founded MBA and Co. and now Talmix while you were based in London, right? Yeah. And then you moved to Singapore. I mean, maybe there were some personal reasons, but I'm asking, of course, in terms of your business, did you find any special uh, reasons on why moving to Singapore seemed like a good idea? Yeah, Singapore is, uh, I think, better than the UK at the moment as a place to live and to build a business. Uh, I, so I left in 2016, just as Brexit was mm. reaching its peak <laughs> and was really taking hold and making, you know, the, I think, the national conversation a little, little stagnant. And if you, I mean, you want to talk about a global outlook, then sort of Brexit is the antithesis. As an MBA company now, Talmix had an office in Singapore. We, you know, we had, uh, 
clients over here. So we knew Singapore to be a wonderful place to live and it was very forward thinking and, you know, the sun is always shining. So mm-hmm. whilst we were, my wife and I were free from responsibilities, we thought we'd go and have one last adventure and you know, it's turned out to be a, a fantastic place to be. So I, I moved over here. I switched to a non-exec role in Talmix and then took on the role of running digital innovation and investments uh, across APAC for the world's largest recruitment company called Adeco. Mm-hmm. Did that for a couple of years uh, and then joined the team at Verimark to help them build out what is, uh, I think, you know, a super exciting global venture that helps companies, as we said, screen and vet prospective employees. But only what we're trying to do is much bigger than that. What we're really creating is a, is a means for candidates to own their own career credentials. And once they've been verified, mm. receive a, a career passport that then they can choose to use not only to help them get jobs or, or in other parts of the employment ecosystem, but also you know, to eliminate all the frictional or just the inconvenience of having to reprove your university degree or your last five years of employment or your address um, you know, in many other walks of life, like opening a bank account or, or renting a car or all these sort of things. So, so we see the, the employment data angle as, as just a very nice jumping off point. But you know, we start by providing a, a service that enables companies to get complete confidence around the, uh, the integrity and credentials of, of people who they're going to join their team. Pretty much a global passport or professional uh, life, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's, that's the output for the person who gets checked. And if you think uh, you know, people are increasingly wanting to take ownership of their own data, self-sovereignty is an issue that is not going to go away. Uh, and now companies that use Verimark have the, the potential to, to give that as a gift to their employees and so it all helps to enhance the the overall candidate experience for anyone they're bringing onto the team which in a competitive talent market is is a prerequisite of course so i mean we have to talk about the challenges of screening international talent even more so now uh, when everything is done remotely so can you explain us what those challenges are or how, how to screen a large amount of international candidates on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the first part is to uh, sort of reiterate the, the importance of doing the screening and certainly in this remote hiring world now. Right? So if you're no longer getting the any sense of that tangible personal benefit that you might have got otherwise through interviewing the person, you know, interviewing the person uh, in a physical location or environment, you know, and they're going to be your first boots on the ground, you know, wherever they may be in the market or such, then, you know, making sure that you do get all of those checks done, uh, you know, is obviously vitally important to, to just ensuring or minimizing the, the risk around those hiring points. The, you know, the challenges all, all come through, you know, how do you manage local market regulation? Mm-hmm. And what, are the, what How do the rules different from Bolivia to Bermuda to, to, to Singapore, right? So the... You know, how can you help any company or who has a, has a HR department in London or has a HR department in somewhere in the States get to grips with what needs or what can be done in those international markets? And that's what Verimark provides. It just provides a, a very simple, single platform that operates globally that can, you know, immediately guides and guides you through the process and tells you what can and can't be done uh, hmm. as well to then bring out the best results uh, and it does so in a, in a fully globally compliant fashion all the necessary security precautions and data precautions from gdpr perspective or whatever the local market regulation will be and uses the the verified and appropriate data sources you just mentioned something that again i also had in my mind now that remote work is something that's here to stay a lot of countries are starting to develop new laws and regulations regarding remote work are you afraid that there is chance of maybe having in the near future more like global legislations regarding recruiting uh, remote work and on all those new trends that are affecting work no i don't think so unfortunately uh i think you know there will be you know, significant improvements in individual country levels around the the treatment of workers and, and certainly sort of the the part time or contract or contingent workforce i think that is uh you know definitely on the cards and you can see some of the if you look at america which is sort of the a big shining light on on what how they're handling uh independent contractors or or gig workers and 
some mm. of the issues there. Uh, I think you'll see lots of company organizations, and certainly as a, as a mode of employment, it becomes increasingly common, but you'll see countries rather starting to to add precautions or security safety nets for, for companies around those sort of things. I think globally, unfortunately, you know, the, the level of coordination that would be required would just be above everyone. And, and you know, work is a very cultural thing, right? So there are you know, entirely different atmospheres in, in work or, or, or mindsets around working in the Nordics versus working in China. Uh, and therefore, to, to try and you know, equalize those would, would just not be feasible. But I think you'll see, again, you know, companies, however, may become increasingly evolved in, in how they, uh, or standardized in how they work with people across regions. I think that will that, definitely, you know, and how they offer benefits and so forth. But largely, I think it will still be a very much a country by country set of rulings. So there is this thing that we've been talking about for the last five years, probably now called, you know, the, the future of work. Uh, but I guess it turned out to be reality. Maybe we should change the name now and it's more like, you know, the present of work. So uh, how uh, much do you believe what we know as the future of work has turned to be out a uh, reality and how much has transformed business, especially since, you know, the pandemic uh, started and uh, remote work has become standard? Yeah, I mean, the, the future is only the future till tomorrow, right? Yeah. So we're, we're always constantly evolving towards that. Uh, and I think the, you know, the future of work is a lovely sound bite, but it, you know, it is, it's constantly being updated. Uh, I mean, the, the great you know, accelerant again here is there's obviously been COVID uh, and the massive transformation that's, that was imposed on the world to have to work out how to work remotely and how to work digitally. But even before that, you had you know, big mega topics around you know, upskilling and reskilling the, the digitalization of the workforce, the, the introduction of AI or the introduction of robotics. Uh, and many of those topics are really still you know, quite early on in, in their nascency. And I mean, yes, robotic process automation is great. And you, know, you look at businesses like UiPath and, uh, or Blue Prism, and you know, they're clearly having a massive impact. But Are they destroying millions and millions of jobs yet? Uh, no. Uh, and are they, you know, will they? I, mean, I think long term, they, they definitely have the, the potential to. But there are increasingly more job titles that have been created through, you know, if you think about chatbots, for example, right? you now have job titles all around conversation design specialists and chatbot experience specialists and chatbot implementation specialists. So there's definitely all these new jobs uh, that have been created and the, the future of work will inevitably become incredibly technology driven and it, but it, and it, it may take a generation to catch up with that full digitalization so there's definitely societal issues that I think will be faced but you know I don't you know, there, there is no end point for the future of work right you know we're always experiencing the future and we're always moving towards again in the long run I think a, a much better operating system for for how work comes to be. Now that we're talking about these new positions and kind of uh, type of professionals, what characteristics uh, make a professional, you know, a worker, a true international talent? Or to make the question in a different way, what tips could you give to workers that want to be hired by international companies? What traits would they need to have? Yeah, I think the, I mean, the, the, the sort of World Economic Forum did some great research around you know, what are the skill sets needed for the future. And I think They, you know, they're they're sort of extremely applicable to your question. You know, how how much you know, it sort of also brings us to sort of what what is the future of education? But you know, how much do you need to learn history by rote now? You, know, you can Google anything, you can find anything out. Even you know, developing skills are becoming somewhat commoditized in many respects. And you, know, you can you know, again that that will be more AI driven in its own self. So even the skill sets of learning how to to code and develop programs are, are becoming more accessible to, to any and all. And so I think it's, it becomes, in answer to the question, it's very much more focused around the soft skills, right? So it's the, it's the ability to, to problem solve, it's the hunger to learn and take on new pieces of information or, or be willing to learn new skill sets quickly. It's, you know, it's collaborating. If, if you think we are going to work in a, in a virtual or remote fashion, You know, learning how to be self-disciplined, to make sure that you do the work, to communicate effectively across virtual channels. All of these sort of things become the prized qualities of a, of a future professional. And I guess, you know, having people 
capable of adapting to a, a workplace w- with a more diverse set of, of teammates, right? So one quality that I don't know how easy you can identify in, in a candidate, right? Yeah, yeah, I think it's only that, that cultural awareness piece and again, it will, will definitely be uh, important and then being able to adapt to that. And then again, increasingly from a leadership perspective, you hear you know, it becomes the, the, the key repetitive you know, statements are, are you know, being obviously authentic and, and true to yourself, but also you know, very much learning how to, to work with each individual person for who they are and therefore understanding what motivates in India versus what motivates in France, or what are the the mindsets around work and delivery uh, yeah, are, are pretty pivotal to to getting stuff done. So uh, we're reaching the end of the conversation, but I just want to ask you something that I mean, there are some buzzwords, you know, that uh, suddenly become hugely popular, but then you rarely find out and face someone that is truly using one of those technologies and really, you know, having a successful business because of it. And I have to ask you about, you already explained about how Verimark works, but I understand that you use blockchain. So the challenge is, if you could briefly explain uh, what blockchain is in case someone here in the podcast doesn't understand exactly what blockchain is. But most importantly, how is truly transforming your business and other kind of businesses? You know, like it's not only a buzzword, but it's something practical that is delivering a difference in what you do on a daily basis. Sure. Uh, okay, you put me on the spot now. How to <laughs> how to succinctly explain uh, blockchain? So, I mean, you know, I, I suppose in, in layman's terms, blockchain is uh, sorry, an independent series of databases that are uh, are still connected and somewhat interwoven with each other. That provide the means for people to both imprint and share records that once stored within that database then can't be changed. Mm. What that means in the world of credential management is that once we have obviously proven and verified that data, it means that we can provide the person with a, a record that cannot be tampered with. Mm-hmm. And so it becomes a statement of, of uh, by virtue, almost becomes a statement of fact uh, that this, this check has been done and, and pre, pre-proven. It also means that the second component to to blockchain is that because it is a uh, in a collection of, of database is that no one single person owns or controls that database so if we think of the the traditional incumbent background screen providers that are, are pretty analog and, and and slow and offer a terrible service uh, in many cases then we, you know, once they've done the checks, they own that data and it becomes their data, their assets and, and so forth. Uh, the difference for us is that we actively then give that data back to the candidate. And then because it is now stored on, on the, the Ethereum mainnet, which is a specific type of blockchain, then the candidate can actually control uh, and access that data uh, or share rather who has access to that data as they wish, independent of Verimark. Hmm. So from our point of view, that's that's really you know, it's the immutability, you know, the the uneditableness of the the data. That means that you know again, once checked, it's you know, there you can trust it. Which, uh, but also then it becomes portable and ownable and shareable by the candidates as opposed to it being dependent on Verimark, uh, which again is sort of re- relating to the the piece around self sovereignty that, that we touched on earlier. To round up your answer, what you're telling me is pretty much what makes Verimark such an innovative company is that use of that technology that is truly delivering something that wasn't possible a few years ago. And it's beneficial for both, you know, the company and the user, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we aim to provide lasting value to, to both the client and the candidate. Uh, and that's, you know, I mean, the blockchain is just one part of the solution. It's, it's, the, it's the plumbing, if you will. It's not... Uh, I mean, it's it's not the, at the root cause. I mean, it's just a one facet of a, mm. an otherwise uh, high quality experience that that does everything it says it will, but also it creates lasting value for, for other stakeholders. And then in, in doing so, um, you know, sort of plants a leading flag in, in making um, credential management just that little bit easier for the individual. Well, that's fantastic, Daniel. Please let us know uh, and share with us uh, if someone wants to contact you or know more about Verimark, where can they reach you? 
Sure, that'd be great. Uh, please reach out at uh, well, either verimark.com, which is V-E-R-E-M-A-R-K.com, uh, or you know, feel free to email me directly at dan at verimark.com. Daniel, it has been a fantastic conversation. I learned a lot, and it's fantastic all the things you are doing. Thank you very much for your time. Wonderful. Thanks very much. Okay, great, to, great to chat with you. This is the end of our show. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember that you can find all episodes on Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. And if you're planning to hire a new global team member, Globalization Partners makes it easy to onboard international talent in a matter of days. Go to globalization-partners.com to get started. This is Going Global, presented by Globalization Partners.